inventory methods. We'll use an example and we'll walk through the four inventory methods, specific identification, first in, first out, last in, first out, and weighted average. We are going to use the same inventory records for each one of the four different methods. So we have a beginning balance of inventory. We have two items and we originally purchased them for $350. Then we're going to purchase four items for $360 from an outside vendor. Then we're going to sell four of those items. We're going to sell four items. And then we're going to purchase 12 more items from another vendor at $380 a piece. And then we're going to sell 10 items and we'll have an ending balance of four items. So comparing and contrasting, we will look at the various inventory methods to determine how each will affect cost of goods sold and ending inventory. Each one of the four different methods is going to give us a different cost of goods sold and a different ending inventory. However, we will find that goods available for sale will be the same for each because under each scenario we had two items at $350 as our beginning inventory and then when we purchased from an outside vendor we have an objective um, amount that we purchased them for, we purchased them for from the other vendor <laughs> and so the, the, what they're purchasing for will be the same under each one of the scenarios so beginning inventory plus purchases equals goods available for sale or merchandise available for sale so it will be the same under all four methods now companies can choose any method they so desire but they must be consistent in the use of the method so they can't switch it back and forth between different methods from month to month Additionally, the, month, the method chosen is not required to mimic the actual flow of goods. For example, a grocery store's flow of merchandise is last in, first out. So the last merchandise that they have in, they want to have it sold first so that things don't go bad. But it can cost its inventory using weighted average or first in, first out. First in, first out means the first inventory's items in are the first ones out, which would mean that older items would be sitting on the shelves and which is not good for fresh produce. But anyway, the, 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 what I'm trying to say is, is that it doesn't have to mimic the flow of goods and they can choose whatever method they so desire in order to cost their inventory. So let's look at some examples. The first one we're going to look at is specific identification. It, for example, this would be used in real estate because we know exactly how much a lot of real estate or a home would cost, and cars because cars have individual VIN numbers. The way to look at specific identification is to look at the beginning inventory. So we had beginning inventory. We had two that we had on hand at $350 a piece. Then we purchased on August 5th, four for 360, and then we purchased an additional 12 at 380. So purchases and inventory or goods available for sale is going to be beginning inventory plus the purchases. So this will give us goods available for sale. Now in specific identification, what happens is when we have a sale, we know exactly how much something cost. So we're going to be deducting that because it's going to be specifically identified from our purchases and inventory. So we, here we have a sale. We sold one at 350, then we sold three at 360, we sold one at 350, and then we sold nine at 380. So we know exactly the amount that we sold each one of the items for, and then this will give us our sales or our cost of goods sold, and then the result from taking um, the cost of goods sold from our merchandise available for sale would give us our ending inventory. So we start with beginning inventory. We add all purchases throughout the month, subtract all sales since it's specific identification where you'll know the cost of each item sold and the remainder will be the ending inventory. And so um, this means that it's easy to determine what, was, what we sold and how much we sold it for um, based upon how much we originally cost, we purchased it for. Now, when we look at the other methods, we will see that we'll be looking at layers of inventory and we have to look at the method that we're, that we're using 
because we won't be specifically identifying when we sell something how much it originally cost us. So it's going to be a different method altogether. It's a tad bit of a cumbersome method. We're going to look at first in, first out, and then we'll look at last in, first out. I agree it's a cumbersome method, but it's the only method that I have ever been able to determine that is sort of foolproof, and I'll walk you through what, how I look at it and what the procedures are. So the first one we're going to be looking at is first in, first out. We're going to be looking at a running balance, so we'll be keeping a running balance of inventory. Then we will look at the number of units in each of the individual layers of inventory. And as I go through the example, you will understand more what I'm speaking of here. Then we will look at a cost per unit. And then we will look at the dollar value of each of the uh, layers of inventory. We will look at the dollar value associated with ending inventory. When um, something winds up in inventory, it can either be something that we're adding to goods available for sale or something that we're deducting under cost of goods sold. So once we put something in the um, under ending inventory, we're going to make a decision as to whether it goes under goods available for sale or cost of goods sold. As I go through this, the method will make a little bit more sense. So let's go to the next step. Next, we're going to have a purchase of four items. So we purchased it from an outside vendor. We know exactly how much we purchased it for. So we're going to give a dollar value associated with the ending inventory. And also, this is something that would be in uh, goods available for sale. Now, these columns are what we are going to be using at the end to be able to solve any homework or test question that you would have saying or ask, asking rather what is ending inventory what was goods available for sale and what were cost of goods sold so now we have to look at our layers of inventory because we have two items at one cost and four items at another cost so we have to look at our layers of inventory and we have to keep them in chronological order so we're going to look at first in and first out going to give a dollar value associated with that so we're putting things in our layers and then under the dollar value associated with each layer next we want to balance now the reason why I added this step I hadn't done it in the past but sometimes students had a problem with the math on looking at the running balance the what was in the number of units that were in each individual layer and then what was in the cost of each and so I added this as a balancing step to make certain that there were no math errors if you want to skip this step you can but I'm going to add it in because it makes it easier for students Next, we're going to have a sale. So now we're going to sell four items, and it's first in, first out. So we have to make a decision. We have four at 360, and we have two at 350 in our layers. But this is first in, first out. So the first layer of inventory in is this two at 350. So we're going to say that we're selling that first layer of two at 350, and we are going to be subtracting this from our ending inventory because it won't be there in our ending inventory. And because it's coming out of ending inventory, we're going to accumulate that information under cost of goods sold so that that information will be uh, available to us as we come to throughout the entire problem. Then the next two out of the four that we sold will have to come out of this layer of four at 360. So now we're selling two at 360, and then this is the costs associated with that. Next, we want to see what is our layers. What do we have remaining? We have two at 360, and we're going to put an individual cost associated with those layers. Next, let's balance. So we see we should have two on hand. Our layers say we have two on hand. The cost of our layers is 720. Last time we balanced our ending inventory was 2140. We subtracted 700 and then 720. So now we should have 720. So we see mathematically we're correct. Next, we're going to purchase 12 more at 380. Add that to ending inventory because it's also available for sale. We'll schedule it there. Then we're going to see what layers do we have now. We have a layer of 2 at 360, and now we have a layer of 12 at 380. We're going to give a dollar value. Then we want to balance. We should have 14. Yes, we do have 14 in our layers. We add up the cost of our layers, and we do have that um, um, ending balance. Now we have the last time we balanced, and then we had this additional purchase. So comparing the two, we know we're mathematically correct. Then we're going to sell 10 items. 
So now we have a decision to make. What layer is going to be affected by the sale of 10 items? Well, our first layer in that we have remaining is 2 at 360, so we're going to be taking out 2 at 360, scheduling it under ending inventory as a deduction, and then putting it also under cost of goods sold. Then the remaining 8 will have to come out of this layer of 12 at 380, so then we'll give a cost associated with that. Now we'll see that this layer has been has gone. So this layer of 2 at 360 is gone. We had 12 at 380, but we sold 8 out of that layer. So that means that 4 remain in that layer. So now we want to balance. We should have 4 on hand. Yes, we do have 4 on hand. The cost of our layers is 1520 when last time we balanced and then we subtracted all of this, then we can see that our ending inventory does equal what we have in our layers of 1520 Our goods available for sale were 6700 and then our cost of goods sold, we're going to add all of these up, and that was 5180 So our goods available for sale, like we said, it's going to be the same for each one because our inventory in beginning inventory is going to be the same for each. We bought this from an outside vendor, so that's going to be an objective, verifiable cost from an outside source. So our goods available for sale will be the same. And then our cost of goods sold, we're going to accumulate all that information. That comes up to our ending inventory. So we now we can answer any homework or test question with reference to that. We're going to do the same thing, but we'll look at how the layers are different for last in first out. So last in first out, same as the beginning here, we have two on hand at 350. Then we're going to purchase four at 360. Well, now we'll have a layer of two at 350, four at 360. Then we're going to balance to make certain we're mathematically correct. Then we're going to have a sale of four. Now this is last in first out. So the last inventory that came in was this last layer here of four, and they were all individually priced at 360. So now we have a sale of four items, and they're going to be individually costed at 360. So now we're going to be subtracting that from ending inventory and also scheduling it out under cost of goods sold. So now we want to see what layers we have left. We have the two, the oldest two on hand at 350, which was in our beginning inventory balance. We can um, schedule this amount into our layers. Now we want to balance, make sure our math is correct. Now we're going to purchase 12 more. And we're going to look at our layers. So we have two at 350 and 12 now at 380. We're going to balance to make certain our math is correct. Then we're going to have a sale of 10. Well, this 10 will come out of the last layer in, last in, first out. So that would be the 12 at 380. So we're going to associate a dollar value with that for our sale, schedule it under the columns where they should be. Now we see and we have a layer. We still have the layer of 2 at 350 hanging around. Now we have 2 left out of the 380. So originally we had 12. We sold 10 at 380. So 10 came out of the 12. So now we have 2. Let's balance. And now we can see that our goods available for sale, again, it's going to be the same. Our ending inventory, however, is different. And our cost of goods sold is different. Now, you'll be happy to see in weighted average, we don't have as many columns. Now, the thing to do with first in, first out, and last in, first out, is to memorize how to do it, but then also to the columns that you should have across the top. Now, weighted average does not require any layers of inventory, so we have a running balance, a cost per unit, ending inventory, goods available for sale, and cost of goods sold. Our cost per unit, we are going to calculate it individually as a company. So the weighted average, a company costs or calculates its own cost per unit. So it's going to be ending inventory divided by the running balance. So here we started off with two items at 350. Now we're going to purchase four at 360. We're going to schedule that under goods available for sale. And now we can see that we have six items on hand. Our ending inventory, adding these two amounts together, we have 2,140. So when I divide that by six, so the 
the cost per unit is calculated as ending inventory divided by the running balance. So now my average cost per unit is 357. So I'm going to be saying that I'm carrying it in inventory at $357 per item. Next, I'm going to have a sale. I'm going to sell four of them. Well, I'm going to cost my sale at my average when I'm carrying it in inventory at $357. So now my four times 357, this is what I'm going to be subtracting from ending inventory and what I'm going to be scheduling under cost of goods sold. Now I'll recalculate the average. It's just good to get in the rhythm of doing it. We, we probably know that it's going to be 357, but we'll just do it just to kind of get in the rhythm of how to do it. So ending inventory divided by the running balance. Now we're going to purchase an additional 12 at 380. So now I'm going to schedule it under ending inventory and goods available for sale. Remember, I want to calculate and, and also accumulate information both under ending inventory, goods available for sale, and cost of goods sold. So you'll have that information to answer uh, questions. Now we have um, a new average because we have a new ending inventory amount and a new running balance. So we're going to take the ending inventory of 5700 5,273 and divided by 14 and so now our weighted average cost per unit is $377. So now we're going to sell 10 of them. We're going to value it at $377 and so now we'll have a, a new average or you can just carry down the old average but you can see that it mathematically works if you take 1,507 and divide it by 4 and so that would give you the average. Again, our goods available for sale remain the same. Our cost of goods sold is different as well as our ending inventory is different.